Sometimes, real life is stranger than fiction. This is a reality trip with Ben Farmer Jr. Hello, everybody. This is Reality Trip. I'm your host, Ben Palmer Jr. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. We are broadcasting live on Facebook at facebook.com slash Ben Palmer Jr. You can leave us your comments and your questions or uh, anything that you'd want to say here on the broadcast live. So I have an interesting question. Is it possible that throughout time with our evolutionary processes, our evolutionary biology, uh, our need for hierarchy, our need for competition and mating, is it possible that that led us to gods and to religion and to violence and oppression? It's, it's a fascinating subject and it's an interesting take. And my next guest has a, a new book out that we're going to talk about today that goes into this. So stick with us. Uh, my next guest is a clinical psychologist specializing in the treatment of combat related PTSD. He is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry. And uh, he's a, a, uh, sorry, he is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio and the author of Alpha God, The Psychology of Religious Violence and Oppression. That's seriously a truly fascinating book. So please help me welcome to the show, Dr. Hector Garcia. Dr. Garcia, how are you doing today? Hey, great, great. Thanks for having me, man. I've been really looking forward to this conversation with you. Dude, this, this is truly a, an amazing, fascinating book. You know, I, I love studying social psychology. I love studying why people do what they're doing. But the take that you have here between alpha males, primates, and, and God is, is truly, truly fascinating. So before we get into the, uh, to the meat and potatoes of this, tell me a little bit about you. Tell me what's your backstory. How'd you get into this field? Uh, I, you know, I, I, I went to school for like psychology. It's clinical psychology. That, that, that's, my, that's my nine to five. I'm, I'm a therapist, but I've always been interested in evolutionary psychology. You know, it's just something that I find really fascinating. It explains a lot. It explains the ultimate reason for a lot of things. Um, and this topic of religious violence is very germane to, you know, current times and, and, and throughout history. And that's, you know, that's the subtitle. The subtitle is religious, uh, the, the psychology of religious violence and oppression. So, you know, it's, it's something that, um, that I have tried to help us gain a greater understanding of through this book and through other things that I've done. Excellent. Excellent. It's a great book. So what I want to do is I want to get into a, a, a couple of bit of the notes. Let's, let's start from the beginning too. Let's talk about for a moment, let's talk about, um, our, 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 our biology from the past. Like what could have led us to there? You have an interesting quote here. I'm going to read from the book here. Um, it says the patterns of behavior, such motivations were passed on by our primate ancestors and are easily evidenced in living non-human primates, our closest living relatives. Despite his upright stance, his clothes, and his sometimes good table manners, man rarely surpasses his most primal impulses. You want to talk a little bit about that? The, the, the main premise of, of the book is that across the world's religions, we have created gods that, um, you know, that have these resplendent qualities that human beings don't have. Um, you know, the God of the Abrahamic faith is just one among many who are described as being omnipotent. So having ultimate power, omniscient, knows everything, everlasting, never dies, immaterial, like doesn't have a, a body like you and I. Yet, this God has been described across many religious traditions as being immensely interested in territory, immensely interested in submission displays, in controlling uh, you know, the sexual behaviors of those lower than him on the hierarchy, he's described as being male, you know. So this idea that we created God in our own image, that's not new to me. It's been around for, for thousands of years. But the idea is that we have projected not only humanity on onto our notions of God, but all that comes with it. And, and you know, the adaptations of of our evolved psychology of our primate brain. So, you know, a, a God shouldn't need those things that, that he, he, claim, he is claimed to be so interested in. He shouldn't need territory. He shouldn't need submission displays. Primates do that. Primates need that. Right? Physical beings need that. They need territory. And so, uh, oh. well, we're having a slightly technical difficulties with the program I have. So go ahead. Go ahead. Did you lose part of that? Yeah, you just you just briefly on that. And, and real quick, um, you'll get ready to get into it. 
um, when it comes to us as primates, when it comes to us as like alpha males, what are the characteristics for some people that may not be super familiar with, you know, our evolutionary biology, not only with us, but primates that share the same characteristic and traits? What are some of the things that you find that are similar when you were doing your research for this book? Uh, you mean like across primate species? Yeah, for well, like especially alpha males and how that relates to that creation. Well, uh, you know, for for one, dominant individuals have prefer preferential access to, to resources. So food, sex, territory, um, and and that's the main thing. It's 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 having a privilege, and and that privilege is understood by others in the hierarchy. And if you um, challenge that privilege, there are usually consequences for that. Um, all of this is related to mate competition, to how men compete for mates between one another, and males of many species compete for mates. They compete for sexual primacy. And they compete to be, to, to have control over the sexual resources in, in, in their communities. So again, you know, men do this, other primates do this, and purportedly across across many religions, you see, you see gods behaving like this. And that's the idea. What was our, our need for this competition? Because some people could say, well, what's, why does competition even matter? Well, we're talking about the premise of how this relates to gods. Yeah, well, you know, this is a, this is a really, that's a really important question. And if our focus is on violence and, and, and why, why men engage in violent behaviors, um, it's really important to understand. Sorry about that. Yeah, and you were talking about uh, the importance of violent behaviors in males. Go ahead. Sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, so, so, so across the natural world, animals compete for resources. You know, and, and most of us think about, about survival resources as food or territory, but, but we also compete for sex because it's not just about survival. It's about reproducing. Um, one important concept to understand is... Um, that what men and women bring to the table reproductively is very different. Women have vastly uh, limited reproductive resources compared to men. So when you look at, when you look at um, sex ratios across the world, roughly, roughly it's about 50-50. 50% men, 50% women, slightly on the side of, of, of men. And that varies by culture. There are some cultures where you have higher ratio of men to women, and mostly this is concentrated in Islamic cultures, but roughly it's 50-50. But a really important concept to understand is what's called the operational sex ratio, and that is the number of sexually available, reproductively available women compared to the number of reproductively available men, and that is vastly skewed on the side of men because Women are reproductively viable, so to speak, from adolescence to menopause. They're limited by pregnancy. Um, they're limited by cultural practices like polygyny, where one man controls the reproductive output of two or, or sometimes many women. So what that does is remove women from the mating pool. So, so bottom line is, Women's reproductive resources are scarce in that sense. So, and, and, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, You're saying, ahead. That, You're they saying were that they were scarce. They're, they're scarce. So, so, you know, nature has done, has programmed uh, men to, uh, to deal with scarcities in a familiar way, and that's, and that's by... In some cases, you know, using aggression to acquire those resources. And that's behind, ultimately, ultimately, uh, behind the vastly disproportionate amount of violence committed by men as compared to women. And so what does that mean? Well, you know, it, it doesn't mean that when men fight, they're consciously thinking, of, oh, I want to I acquire a, a woman. I want to acquire a mate. In some cases it does, you know, groups like Boko Haram and ISIS, they are promised women, uh, you know, sexual slaves in, 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 you know, in the process of jihad, and they've, and they've gotten them. 
right? But most times it's, it's, it's not conscious. Um, there's a ton of evidence suggesting, however, that that is a strong motivation. So when you look at men's reproductive peak, men's sexual peak, about 18 to 26, 27, something like that, that also coincides with their most aggressive years, their most violent years. There's a, there's a really amazingly, um, you know, the, the correlation, you can just overlay those upon one another really easily. Um, wartime rape is incredibly common across, across the world's wars, and where it's not common, it's strictly outlawed, right? Um, another, another fascinating bit of information, bit of evidence about this is that in societies where polygyny is allowed, you see more revolutions. So what are revolutions? Who fights revolutions? It's young men trying to topple the power structure, trying to topple the dominance hierarchy. So, you know, you Any yeah, coming back, coming, yeah, coming back, sorry, and, and I, I want to just interrupt you anyways, because I, re I really want to get into what we're talking about, the hierarchy. Um, when we have a species that's trying to overcome a hierarchy, a lot of times we're talking about status here, and that creates a lot of stress for lower rung statuses. Can you kind of build a bridge on how someone on a lower rung status or an alpha male has to compete within that structure and how that relates to what we're talking about here? Like how, how alpha, alphas have to compete with subordinates? Yeah, because especially with most primates are, you know, if uh, I, was, I was watching a video where uh, I saw that the, the alpha males create a lot of stress in lower ranking monkeys a lot of times, especially in baboon species and stuff. So that stress and that anxiety creates a lot of, you know, tension, which can create aggression and anger. And when we're talking about revolutions, like we talk about, you know, in, in, in the Middle East and whatever, I think what's happening is a lot of stress and anger and um, um violence happens but i think if we go back in time if we look at the time of christianity islam i think this a lot of this aggression and violence do you want to connect those together oh man well there's a there's a really interesting literature on on testosterone and how that relates to being on the hierarchy you know when you're higher on the hierarchy you have higher levels of testosterone generally speaking so what is testosterone well it's the hormone that's responsible for sex and aggression um We've done studies where, where when men lose competitions, sporting competitions, other kinds of competitions, their testosterone drops. Uh, and, and, you know, some people have suggested, well, that, that, allows, that allows men to not go for those resources, those, those sexual rewards of, of comp competing, to withdraw and to live to fight another day and maybe reproduce another day. Um, one thing that predicts re-engaging in the fight is... Uh, is not a drop in testosterone after a lose. But a jump in testosterone. So these these struggles get played out, you know, not only in sporting events, but you know, among non human primates. Do you think that can and, and real quick, do you think that can also lead to looking back in time when there was a lot of stress and anxiety, not being able to overcome the alpha male that we would almost create a super alpha male to kind of deal with the chaos and the struggle. I mean, life is hard. There's fear, there's uncertainty, there's anxiety, there's competition. Yeah. Is it, is it possible that, for example, I think of um, uh, the early Christians during the time of Rome, they had a lot of oppression happening to them these systems that they created, is it possible that there's this higher alpha male that would give us the ability to, you know, for, for, for justice and for competition? Does that make sense? Well, I think, I think that, that, I think that alpha male in the sky, so to speak, has always been used to, to, to try and establish order, um, you know, because alpha, alpha males who are mortals, they're within the, the reach of, of the spears and the fists or whatever of their subordinates, right? But the alpha male in the sky, you can't, you can't really, you can't really challenge him. And but you know the the ruse has always been, hey, you know it's the most powerful male in the universe. I have an alliance with him. I speak for him. I speak directly for him, and he wants for me all these rewards that that I need to fulfill my reproductive evolutionary destiny. You know that's that's been that's been the biggest biggest ruse, I think, 
you know, so, so men higher up on the religious hierarchy or the secular hierarchy always had greater access to mates and to money and to, you know, and to, and to the ideas that, that, that are allowed to be spoken. Yeah, sorry about that. It, so real quick too, give me some examples of characteristics that these gods have that are the same as human quality alpha males. So territoriality for once, you know, for one, I should say, why why would why would God who doesn't need territory be so interested in territory and carve out territory? Um, interested in in shows of submission, you know. And and the way the, the way that gods are reported to require submission it just looks really familiar right when when across the animal world animals show submission to one another by shrinking down you know by 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 bowing i mean you can see this in chimpanzees and you know submit uh uh lesser males or lesser females will bow down before more dominant individuals and that communicates hey i'm small I'm like an infant, you know, I'm smaller than you, I'm less powerful, I don't pose a threat. You know, I, I relinquish my claim to whatever resources you want, you know. So we see that in men, you know, bowing before dignitaries, you know, bowing your head, making yourself smaller, kneeling, you know. Um, well, you, you have, you know, the Abrahamic gods requiring that, submission display among its subordinates, but this is a being without material form. Why would he require that? He doesn't have, he doesn't have a body. He's, you now he's ultimately powerful. Why would he need a submission display that, you know, would connote smaller size if he doesn't have a body unless he's based on us? So, you know, it's the word for Islam translates to submission. And, you know, three times a day in the Islamic world, people bow down to show their smaller size to their God. If you've ever been to a Catholic church. Which I have. I've, 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 actually, I've actually been to a Catholic church. I grew up Catholic and I know always kneeling and submitting to that God was always like, you know, what, so, if, so if we have that submission, right, then why is there still violence when it comes to religion? You think, okay, I'm submissive. Most of these species, they're, you know, they, they're crouched, they're, 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 they don't really attack. But I also tend to find that most species that are submissive actually have a lot of aggression. Would you agree? Well, I think it certainly builds resentment, right? Is that where, is that where you're going? I think yeah, right. yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah sure. It, but, but, you know, um, just that eventually someone's probably bound to rebel against that. But I think, I think ultimately it, it serves to maintain order within the tribe. You know, the more people um, bow to the alpha god, the more adherents are paying attention and abiding by certain rules of the in-group, and the more powerful, the more, the more powerful the group is. You know, it's all, it's all about, it's all based on tribalism, you know. And, and you know, so. I'm, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, so, you know, Gods have always led men into battle as well. And so, um, you know, there's a certain utility to um, showing subordination to representatives of God, you know, just having a hierarchy because you, you've been to Catholic Church and, and you've probably seen on TV, like, how do people behave to the, to the Pope or to the bishops or anybody on the, on the hierarchy? They do the same thing. They bow down. They kiss the ring. They show submission. And, and they establish a hierarchy within the religious order, well, hierarchy kind of serves a purpose militaristically. One of the things that, um, that I also want to talk about too real quick is that there's this perception out there that because we talk about these uncomfortable subjects, for example, we're talking about male violence, which is extremely important now. We've got school shootings happening. We have terrorism happening. We yeah. still have wars. We have genocides actually happening. Yeah, man. That somehow we're bashing males that somehow we're beating down on males. And I, I want to bring up an interesting talk that you were a part of on the thinking atheist with Seth Andrews, who I, who I love. I'm not here to criticize the conversation, but I was a little concerned that he felt that that's what was happening, that somehow we were bashing males. You want to talk a little bit about what I'm talking about first before we get into it more? 
Yeah, yeah. I actually, that's a. I have a lot to say about that. So, you know, I, I and I, I honestly, I, I like Seth too, but I think that that focus was a bit misplaced. It just kept coming back to, but wait a minute, men are going to get upset by this, and by this I mean, you know, having the kind of conversation that we're having that, you know, that's exposing the biggest predictor of violence, which is being male, you know, and, and, you know, my thought is the way it went in the conversation, my thought is if you, if you overly qualify something or even apologize for any possible misinterpretation, you're going to get the very response that you're trying to avoid. People are going to think, oh man, you know, he's being so cautious. It must be pretty bad. Because, you know, that, that's the kind of emotional reason that we, that we fall into. But, but here's the thing. There is a very common error in thinking regarding evolutionary science. Something is natural. And just because something's arrived at through genetic means or biological means, means that it's desired or ethical or inevitable, but it's it's usually none of those things. I mean, you and I, Ben, could talk all day about how we could resist, you know, our worst evolutionary impulses. And you know, apart from that, I, I really think that um, the more we understand about our evolved psychology, the better, not the worse, we're going to be able to resist the impulses that we don't want and to make more rational choices. So, so the so getting back to the conversation, the question came up about what, what would I tell those men who might feel threatened by that research? And, you know, I kind of half jokingly said, well, I tell them to suck it up, you know. Um, <laughs> but, look, there's, there's several ways that, or a couple ways that, that one might come to experience that threat. And one is that rational thoughtful men may commit that fallacy. And they may think, listen, if I, if I accept this idea that I may have the, the capacity for violence somewhere within me, that makes me more likely to commit it. And I don't want that. And so, so for those men, it's really important to understand, understand that fallacy so that we can avoid making it. Um, but on the other hand, those in positions of power, whether we're talking economic power or, or a, a race or a political party or a religion or gender, they always protest when inequality in their favor is scrutinized. Um, and the saying that goes something like, you know, the privilege often experience equality as oppression. Um, but forbidding questioning is very dangerous. And Seth wasn't forbidding questioning. He's you know, probably the opposite. But still, we, humanity, we, we've got to be careful because forbidding questioning the hierarchy, that's a tactic that the powerful use to maintain their privilege to maintain their rank or even to maintain injustice. Now, bringing this all back to Alpha God, this is something that I, that I cover in the book. And it's interesting we're talking about primates because when you, when you look at other primate species, Ben, um, like we said, the dominant individual has, has greater access to, to sex and food and things like that. And that, that inequality isn't questioned. If it is questioned, you better be ready for a fight. And, and, and you're probably going to get rolled because usually those in the position of dominance are there because they're bigger or they're stronger or they have better alliances. Um, so it's an unspoken rule that you don't question the alpha's privilege, right? But, but there are parallels in, in humans. Although we have the capacity for abstract thought, we have the capacity for, you know, we create things like religions and laws and things like that. You know, in Saudi Arabia, Ben, if you can do hard prison time for criticizing the king, and this easily bleeds over into religion, you know, this, um, 
you know, one of the things I write about, you may remember, is this idea of papal infallibility, where you don't question the words of the Pope because they're the words of God. You know, the idea of heresy. You don't question the written word of God. Um, never wrote anything, right? Men, men, men write scripture, and they do so to favor their own evolutionary interests. And the bottom line for me is that like, gods don't commit violence. They don't, they don't start jihad or crusades or inquisitions. They don't steer airplanes into buildings. They don't blow themselves up in crowded marketplaces. They don't kill people for apostasy. Men do that. Men do that. So men do not get a, do not get a pass on our scrutiny. We ha if we want to change religious violence or violence of any kind, we can't just focus on religion. We have to focus on the ultimate source. And that is men, you know, and, and religion, to be honest, is just one way that, that, that men express their evolutionary drives, that, that men engage in violence. I mean, do it through so many other means. So, yeah, that's, yeah, one, that's of one of the things, things that I want to try to, some, some people, people know I'm getting ready to work on a new film where I want to talk about this because we, we talk about guns, we talk about terrorism, we talk about domestic violence, but I feel like we're just, scratching the surface and we're not getting to the core. I, I, I don't feel we should be afraid of these topics. And, you know, when he was talking about how, well, what if, you know, religions think that we're just some knuckle dragging, you know, barbaric kind of whatever. I think what makes science and skepticism important in these subjects is we're willing to look at things as they are and, and to address them as they are. And if we're going to be serious about these, you know, policies, politics, uh, religious terrorism. I mean, any type of dogma. I mean, if we want to understand Kim Jong Il or Donald Trump or whoever is out there, we've got to understand throughout time. These are the social structures that we've built. These are the ways that we've dealt with hierarchy, with competition, with everything that you just said, which is what's really fascinating about your book. And I want people to understand that to not be afraid of it, because what you should be more afraid of is people that don't understand it and keep doing the same things over and over. If you really want to understand school shootings, if you really want to understand why so much violence is happening, these are the subjects of what we need to talk about. And we can relate ourselves to other primate species for the same exact thing. What are your thoughts on that? Man, you, you, I think you nailed it. And I'm, I'm, I'm really excited for you about this, about this project. I think it's a terrific idea. We can't be afraid. We have to look in the mirror and not flinch because the discomfort of, you know, Facing some truths about who we are pales in comparison to the alternative, which is just enacting these patterns over and over and over, letting letting you know letting despotic men into positions of power to just rape and pillage us in every way that they can, um, and, and not understand where it, where it comes from. You know, to to you know to engage in religious warfare and think that you no, know, my my group really my group really is the chosen group. You know, we really are are our violence is sanctioned by God. You know, if we don't understand where this all comes from, we're going to do more of it. And we have to understand it using the best tools that we have. And science is arguably, I would, I would say the best tool for understanding all our biases because it has built in mechanisms designed if, if practiced correctly to, to minimize bias. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think that's an important point. It's scary for a lot of people, but you got to face it. Yeah, they, they can't let fear stop them. And you know what I really like about your book, too, is, is that you're not, you're not bashing religion. I want people to understand that. What's really good about your book is you're looking at it objectively. You're not trying to bash it and say, oh, you're stupid for believing stuff. It's just why is it we came to these conclusions and not just Christianity, not just Islam. And I, here's, here's a premise that I wonder if we can maybe get into for a moment. And I want to know what your thoughts are. I don't know if you've ever been asked this question or not, but... Um, when I look at religious cults and not just religion, like Christianity or whatever, let's just say cults, there's even spiritual cults that are out there. Do you feel like that these men who start these cults, do you feel that they are doing, do you, do you feel that these cults are doing the same exact thing that religious people did in the time? They're, they're trying to gather a group. A lot of them are, 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 are women that follow these cult members. Do you find some parallels of the alpha male and these cult leader groups out there? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I lost that little last piece that you said, but I think I, because of the tech difficulties, but I think I, I, think I got it. Do, do cults follow the same patterns? Is that, is that the question is, 
is like other religions? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I mean, um, uh, so Joseph de Mabrio, I mean, like, there's like, there's all these cult leaders that, that tend to fleece those beneath them or have sex with all the congregants. You know, this is alpha male behavior that takes place over and over and over with the promises of, of something, you know, the promises of freedom from death, of protection, of, of, of you know, that life will go on, you know, some, some kind of promise. So if, if that's what you're talking about, about how, you know, the dominance hierarchy plays out in those things, just like it does in organized religions. Yeah, absolutely. It plays out in everything. You know? Yeah, which is important because I want to show that not it's not just religion that this is happening. And, I, and like I said, you did a very good job respecting that. But I wanted to also show that this can happen in other types of belief systems. And you can see the same parallels of human behavior within that. For example, like you said, you know, the cult members I see over and over having sex, you know, the competition, you know, that brings up a, another point that I want to bring up. Let's talk a little bit about jealousy for a moment, because it's an interesting subject just in itself. But you were bringing up in the book about how jealousy is important to not only man, but to gods, but having to do with and if I screw this up, please help me fix it. Um, w when you have kids. If they're not your kids, there's a greater consequence to not having kids. So can you parallel between jealousy and not having your kid before I screw it up? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, no, I think, yeah. So, so you're talking, I think you're talking about the section on. Oh, I think we lost you one more time. All right. One more time. Yeah. The section on what? No worries. The, the, the section on cuckoldry, I think you're talking about. So this yes. term cuckoldry comes from, uh, this is where biology and evolutionary sciences can come and it's so handy because, you know, when you, when you hear what things like jealousy are ultimately based on, it's intuitive. I mean, you're like, oh, yeah, that totally makes sense, you know. So cuckoldry comes from, from the, the, the cuckoo bird. Everybody's heard of the cuckoo bird. And one of the things that it does is it lays eggs in competitor species' nests to, to leave them to fend for, to, to take care of their, their hatchlings. And often it's like a much smaller species that kind of kills itself trying to feed this off, this 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 this, uh, this chick that doesn't belong to them. Um, so, you know, men have to be concerned with this as well because men can never, you know, be a hundred percent certain that their that their child is is theirs, whereas women are always a hundred percent certain. Um, so. So, um, you know, when we look at, at, at jealousy across these, these huge international studies, men tend to be, tend to be more uh, jealous, uh, sexually jealous. So that's not to say that women can't or shouldn't be sexually jealous. They are, but a greater, a greater proportion of it uh, lies with men because that jealousy would prevent men from getting cuckolded, right? And that leads to all kinds of behaviors that are problematic for us, like mate guarding and one of the points that I make in the book is that that's where you know corralling your women off into you know into um, uh, you know nunneries or, or, or places where other men can't access them that's where that comes from or swathing them in drapery like the burqa so that other men can't see them um, or worse practices like like you know You know, that's, that's all ultimately geared towards preventing other men from having access to your sexual claims, you know. And it's not nice. You know, it's not pleasant, but there's an explanation for it. How does that relate to uh, God's being jealous? You were saying this earlier, and I, I always find this a fascinating subject because personally, if I was a God, I wouldn't be jealous of anybody. Why, why would I care about what anybody thought about me? Why would I be jealous of any? I, I just, I just find that if you, if, if I could build an entire universe, I understand chemistry, I understand physics, I understand all this stuff. And I'm, and I'm worried about this little speck human being. How does that relate to the jealousy of gods out there? Right. Cause we projected our evolutionary drives onto, onto God. So for, for mortal beings, Acquiring resources, taking the risks, spending the time, spending the energy to provide for our offspring. You know, human offspring spends a marathon of time in, in dependency. So providing those kind of resources, taking those kind of risks, spending those, that kind of energy for offspring that isn't yours, that's dangerous. 
that's worse than not reproducing. Um, for an omnipotent God who doesn't need resources in any way, why would he be so jealous? But, but you know, the God of, the, of, of, of Abraham is unequivocally jealous, or at least he's described that way. I mean, all the stuff that he did uh, in Revelations, all the horrors that he rained down on earth was because his wives cheated on him. His wives were Samaria and Jerusalem, the ancient cities of the biblical era, and that's and that's that that is how he was. That, that was the, the reason given for for those those horrors. Um, you see that even in the obsession with virginity. Well, back before we had contraception, having a virgin bride was the best way of ensuring that you're not going to be raising another man's child. But um, Mary was a virgin, um, Krishna's mother was a virgin in, in Hinduism. Um, That's such a great point. I never, I never thought about why there's so many virgins throughout history, but that, that's, a, that's a fascinating point. Why, why, do you, why would nuns have to be virgins to serve God? You know? and so all this stuff is overlaid onto these really old, really ancient you know, psychological adaptations that, 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 that they just don't reconcile with this idea of an everlasting omnipotent God. You know. So how far back do you know that we've been doing this with mythology? Like, are there other like Greek mythology that we, I mean, I know, I know there is, but there, is there some examples that you can point out where we can see these same characteristics with jealousy, competition, all the stuff with gods even prior to this? Because some people will say, well, you know, um, Christianity, this is what led to our morals and everything else. But I, I think you can go far back in time and find other gods. Can you give any examples of any other types of gods or stories thousands of years prior to that? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the Greek gods for, you know, were notoriously sexual. And, and, and you know, Zeus was, was legend to have all these sexual relationships with, with women and even raped some a woman, I forget her name. Um, but, you know, a lot of Christianity inherited a lot of the, the mythos that came out of that region. Um, what's even more telling is looking at hunter-gatherer tribes. So the Kungsan have a god that, that does the same kind of behavior. The Blackfoot uh, have a god that, that does the same kind of behaviors, chasing women, um, you know, throwing thunderbolts at their male rivals. I wanted to bring up your in chapter seven here the maladaptive submission to the godhead i'm going to read this paragraph briefly real quick uh while offering little c consolation to those suffering the mental anguish of clinical depression scholars of evolutionary psychi psychiatry have pointed out how low motivation pessimism inactivity and other depressive symptoms very likely aided the finesse a uh, fitness of our ancestors chiefly by smoothing the way to submission to more powerful, more dominant, and otherwise dangerous individuals. You want to talk a little bit about what that means and what that, why you wrote that? Yeah, so, so like we were talking about earlier, you know, when, when people lose competitions, their testosterone drops and, and changes to the serotonin levels happen. So, um, you know, the idea is that allows us to remove ourselves from potentially dangerous confrontations with, uh, from those with... Uh, uh, with those with more power than us. And it's, it's kind of um, odd to think about psychopathology as having an, a, an advantage, right? It, it's being selected for, like helping us. Um, but but a, lot of, a lot of what we regard as, as psychopathology does just that. I mean, for example, the specific phobias that, specific phobias are way more concentrated um, uh, you know, in, in fears of snakes, heights, things like that, that were dangerous to us in our evolutionary past. Even places where you're never going to encounter a, a poisonous snake, like like maybe New York City or Iceland or who knows. Um, so so just because it feels unpleasant, that doesn't mean it wasn't adaptive for us. The fear that that we experience keeps us away from from the snakes, right? It helps us to survive. Um, the same thing with depression. You know, another another example is seasonal affective disorder, where people get really depressed when uh, it's it's cold outside and the ambient light starts to fade. Um, well, in the in the days of our ancestors, 
um, with withdrawing, taking in a lot of calories, not expending a lot of energy, that helped us in, in, in times like that because resources were scarce out there. You might leave the camp and encounter a blizzard. I mean, there's all kinds of, 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 of hazards. So that's why people with seasonal affective disorder, they get they, they, they drop in energy, a drop in motivation, they crave high sugar, high carb foods. It serves us. Um, so the idea that was developed most by, by John Price was that depression may serve a function in navigating the dominance hierarchy. When you're depressed, you lose interest in food, you lose interest in sex. Well, if you're trying to withdraw from the dominant individual's claims, that's a good thing to lose interest in. And, you know, there are parallels in religion. And, and I, 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 I don't, I'm not pathologizing all of religion. I think understanding the extreme version, the extreme kinds of psychological phenomenon makes it clearer for study. So on the extreme end, you know, there are a lot of extreme religious practices like committing suicide um, to sidle closer to your God. You know, um, it, it, it's, it, it, can, it can open up for study, you know, how these all interrelate, you know, psychopathology, depression, withdrawal, submitting. Um, so when you're depressed, for example, um, again, you don't have an appetite for food or for sex as much. Well, there are lots of religious rituals where you give up food or sex for your God, like Lent, for example, um, like Ramadan, for example. But again... Why would a God want that? You know, why would a God who doesn't need food require you to do that? Dominant apes require that, right? You back off of their, their food claims and their mating claims. Um, but two, this, you know, when you're depressed, you feel a sense of, of worthlessness. You know, I'm no good. I'm worthless. Um, and there's a good case to be made that that sense of worthlessness is based on on weighing yourself against other people in the hierarchy. So how many religions have that idea built into their doctrine that like compared to God, I'm nothing, I'm worthlessness, I'm meek, I'm little, I'm small, you know? So there are parallels and it's important to study these parallels so we can understand, you know, where, where do certain rituals come from? Where do certain religious experiences come from? Are they healthy for us? Yeah, you okay. know, that's what's interesting, too, because everybody wants to talk about mental health in this country. And now I'm starting to think and wonder, is that good for our mental health to be putting ourselves in these submissive, depressive states where we're not worthy enough for these these guys? That's got to take an emotional toll on us at some point. I mean, I, I don't know. Some people, they say, well, religion is beneficial. But if you listen closely to a lot of the doctrines that that religious people actually um talk about there always you always do have the sense of worthlessness and i wonder could that be adding to a lot of the problems of depression and anxiety in society i mean or or even worse yet these these young men who are vulnerable to joining terrorist organizations they feel that this is their way to become i, I guess an alpha male the, themselves well both of those are, are are true i think it's it's complex with the religion because this there's there's research showing that that uh you know, the faithful have better mental health, and there's research saying, showing that, um, you know, poorer mental health. Um, there's certain, there's certainly something to be said about the sense of belonging that you get when you, when you're, you know, you have a religious community, and that's powerful. I think that's, that's, that explains so much about the, you know, the good aspects of religion and the, and the negative aspects of religion. Um, you know, what religion isn't a tribe? You know, what religion doesn't, doesn't, Provide a sense of unity that mirrors the, you know, the, the our ancestral environments where we were surrounded by people who supported us, under the protection of a headman, you know, so to speak. But the problem is, is that those kinds of groups are so prone to identifying the outsider. It's an in-group, out-group kind of mentality. And so, you know, earlier, just to kind of, you know, follow my own stream of consciousness way of thinking. Earlier, you mentioned that, you know, I wasn't really bashing religion, and I, and I wasn't. I think in, in the, the last chapter I talked about, there are many positive aspects of religion, a sense of belonging, a sense of unity. There are a lot of pro-social messages across every religion. Take care of the weak. Take care of the homeless. You know, respect your elders. Don't kill. Don't rape. But 
almost always that only refers to the in-group. At the periphery of the group, that morality banks big time, you know. So, so one one point that I that I make every chance I can get is is that one of the things that Moses did when he came back from 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 the mount carrying that stone tablet that that read "Thou shalt not kill." Is he ordered his men to slaughter three thousand people from the rival tribe? So it didn't mean murder is off. It just means murdering your own kind. The other, the outsiders are fair game. The same with, you know, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. But raping the outside tribe's women was something that Moses directly commanded, and and it was pretty common in the biblical era. So it's all about maintaining in group unity. And and that's that's I think one of the biggest limitations of religion, but it's not just religions. It's political parties. It's it's sports teams. I mean, we 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 have difficulty extending beyond the tribe, and there's research showing that all kinds of human groups they stop functioning as well when you grow bigger than 150, 200 people. Unity breaks down in business, sports teams, the military, whatever. Which so. is interesting because I, I often wonder that, too, when it comes to our political system. Like, can one man, a president, govern millions of people? I don't think that we evolved to be able to govern, like you said, more than 150 at a time. But for whatever reason, we've created societies where we think that that's, that that's possible. Well, we struggle with that. We struggle with that. So, so we have these Stone Age brains that we're, that we're struggling with, you know, to – live in these enormous societies with all kinds of technology that wasn't around. Um, we have a great capacity for innovation and, and to adapt, but we, we strain against that. And that's why having these conversations is so valuable. That's why evolutionary science is so valuable because it, it tells us why we strain against this, why when we try to build workable, functioning, cohesive societies, why we tend to divide along partisan lines or religion or race or whatever. Um, what side of the river, you know, when, by, by neighborhoods, you know, it tells us why. It gives us the blueprints for that. Yeah, it's, it, it really is fascinating, especially when you look at it. And I, I want to explore this more in the film. And, and like I said, if I could bring you on, I'd love to do that. Because talking about gang violence and all the stuff that's going on, it, it, man, it, it, it paints such a, a great picture of why we're doing what we're doing. And, and these conversations just aren't happening. It's what we were talking about off camera just a second ago. These conversations aren't happening. If we're serious about solving these problems, here's, a, here's another question I have and what your, what your thoughts are. Cause I want to, hopefully maybe this could lead into you talk about your next book. Um, when we're talking about politics, especially what's going on in America right now. Um, one of the things I noticed in this political election with Donald Trump right now is, uh, did we elect a man who is perceived to be an alpha male based off of our insecurities. Like we, we tend to elect strong, strong men throughout time. This is why we had Hitler and Mussolini. I know people don't like using the word fascism. This can happen on the left or the right, but I tend to find that when we're in a state of uncertainty and fear and anxiety, we'll gravitate to these alpha males, these strong leaders. Do you think that played a part with the uncertainty in society going on now that would elect not only a Donald Trump, but these other type of leaders like in Turkey and the Philippines and stuff like that? It, it absolutely, it absolutely has a role, you know, and and yes, you know, there's a there's a pretty robust literature suggesting that we we are we are attracted to to large, loud, brash leaders, you know, to to to, to bigger leaders, to taller leaders. So there was a study looking at at the presidential election for I don't know how many years in the U.S., but like a, a, a long span, and um, almost all of the the winning candidates were the taller candidate. You know, um, taller men in business <clears throat> are usually higher up on the hierarchy. Taller uh, men in, 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 in the church are usually higher up on the hierarchy. Why is that? You know, none of our leaders are going to represent us in a fight, not in a real fight. But we carry this primitive psychology from a time where, you know, our, our leaders might try to protect us in a fight. They might be good in battle. You know, they might be a good person to ally with. Um, so, so the more fearful among us glom onto that more strongly. And there's, there's actually um, a lot of evidence to suggest that people on the, 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 
the right side of the political spectrum um, tend to be more fearful than those on the left. They tend to have, you know, fear of tend to respond with greater fear to all kinds of stimuli. And there's even there's even neurological evidence. So people on the right tend to have a bigger amygdala, the 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 brain structure that produces fear and aggression responses. But the thing is that gets manipulated. That's what's concerning is that people who are really savvy about, about evolutionary psychology on the top, the, the political analysts, the handlers, they know, they know what our fears are and they target them. And so they try to generate fear to get support for a candidate. And, and, and that's, that's, that's the part that's, that's concerning to me. And that's why we have to be aware of, of all our evolutionary hot buttons, so to speak. Yeah, you were talking about on a, uh, another interview that you had about how liberals can be characterized a little bit more feminine and conservatives maybe more masculine, like dad and mom type of thing. Um, first off, do you want to explain what that what that what you're talking about when we're talking about that? Yeah, and this is this is the the subject of my upcoming book, um, and, and the idea is that you know. I think liberalism has a certain feminine quality to it, and this is something that has been that has been studied on using using uh, sexual inventories where you kind of um, look at gender. What do you identify with? Being nurturing, being caring, being giving, um, versus do you do you or do you have an emphasis on authority, on strength, on things like that? And political conservatives tend to be more towards the latter, and liberals more towards the former. So those, those have, you know, that, that's what we call a gender because men and women can have differences along those lines, both. So, um, but still, you know, when you look at the need for hierarchy, when you look at the need to look up to a powerful leader, that's, that's a trait that you see among men and in male hierarchies. And it's, it's not hard to place this in, into the environment of our ancestors where, you know, we were warring coalitions of, of led by men that, um, that regularly went to the rival tribe and slaughtered them and took their women and did all kinds of things like that that shaped our, our psychology. I mean, the, the, when we were hunter-gatherers, it was not a nice time to live. Um, Violence and and death was uh, at, at the hands of of, of of coalitionary violence was extremely high. There's one study that looked at at hunt, contemporary hunter gatherers that found that 30 percent of of men in those societies are killed at the hands of other men. That's that's a huge percentage. So um, you know uh, the the point I'm making is that uh, conservatism uh, conservatism draws upon those adaptations that we had to turn towards this tribe, turn towards these male coalitions for protection. And, uh, and you know, the hierarchy, the seating up control to the, uh, you know, to the dominant male, that has militaristic value to it. You know, that's useful on the battlefield. Is that more, why more likely they're also probably likely to be religious in themselves? There's that authority figure, there's the strong man, there's this, you know, protector out there absolutely absolutely there's there there are those parallels in in religion too so there's there's a militaristic strain through political conservatism when we start to measure it um when we start to break it down and design instruments to measure it and and through you know authoritarian kinds of religions no question you know what's and, interesting is is why then why is Jesus so um feminine like uh, like the Buddha is that same way it's interesting that there's this dominant male figure but there's this feminine quality to jesus oh gosh jesus would definitely have been a liberal i mean <laughs> the passion the like being open to other people you know the the you know he hung out with prostitutes and lepers and things like that no question uh you know that's that's why it's pretty striking that that you can have such a contrast between those on the conservative right who claim to be Christians but really don't follow Jesus, his teachings or his, you know, personality much at all. They more follow the God of Yahweh, who is, who is kind of a hard ass, you know, and an authoritarian <clears throat> and warlike. One thing my wife brought up is, is how come there's no 
like there's a couple women gods, but even the women gods are about love and compassion. And, you know, they're not warriors as far as I know. There are some war, you know, warrior women gods, but, but, but not a lot. And, and so, yeah, so I think, I think all, all the projections we make, <clears throat> pardon me, out into the, out into the clouds where we imagine, you know, beings out there, we project, you know, female psychology as well. <clears throat> and, and, um, who knows? I think, I think you're right. I think, you know, um, liberalism, um, as reflected in, politics or religion or figures such as Jesus Christ is often an attempt to, to, to level the hierarchy, you know, to, to, to achieve a, a sense of balance, you know, so, so those who are downtrodden more glom on to liberal, liberal philosophy more. And, and Jesus was certain, certainly that way. I mean, he wasn't a capitalist. I mean, look what he did to the marketplace in Jerusalem. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a parallel there. I think you're onto something with that thought. It's funny because it was like this oppression coming from Rome, but that oppression of, of Rome ended up becoming the predominant religion, which is what we are now in a Western society. It's just, I don't know. It's just, it's just a weird connection there. I don't know what the, what, what the parallel is, but I'm, I'm seeing a pattern when it comes to that. I'm wondering if that's, you know, where it's drawn into it. So, well, one thing to, you know, to, 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 you know, speak to your to your wife's question is like I, I just I just wonder if the gods you know if religion is based on on kindness and submission just just didn't stand a chance to those based on conquest and territorial gain you know I mean more than half of the world's practitioners religious practitioners follow the Abrahamic faiths you know and that's because it was it was so successful as a strategy as a philosophy and and also because it's so intuitive, you know, it's so intuitive. We, we understand very deeply, very intuitively, this idea of a dominant male protector um, who expects certain things from us. And, uh, and you know, that it's no surprise that, that uh, you know, that a philosophy that's based on territorial gain would have an advantage to a more peaceable philosophy. It, it, it really is fascinating. I, I, even right now, I just there's there's so many things that keep coming to mind now about things that make more sense now that we're talking about this evolutionary process. Um, Muslims, when they go to the afterlife, they're getting mainly virgins. Mormons with multiple women. I mean, like th these connections are made. That's what I'm trying to say. Like even now, just thinking about why we're doing what we're doing and that and how if you if you mix it with evolutionary biology and, and psychology and religion, there's so many parallels there. Yeah, that's the thing about evolutionary science. You know, a lot of people who, who who read my book and who read in this field in general, like they 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 say, "Oh, wow! It is it is so obvious now that I see it. I just didn't see it. Like when you understand it, it's so intuitive, and you know that you know that that this it all just makes sense." Yeah. But but usually we're blind to our instincts, you know, because they're so old and they operate seamlessly in the background. Um, uh, Cosme, uh, John Cosmetis and, and, and or Lita Cosmetis and John Tooby, they're kind of the founders of evolutionary psychology out of UC Santa Barbara. They called this instinct blindness. Like we're, we're usually not aware of our own instincts, you know, but, but when you study them, it's just, you can't deny it, you know. That's, you that's such a good point. I don't mean to interrupt you, but before I forget that point, that instinct blindness, I remember you talking about this before. I'm glad you brought this up. Being aware of that blindness I think is cr critically important, not just when it comes to religion or impulses, but when we're marketed to, you know, when we, we have political candidates that tell us what we want to hear. Can you dig a little bit deeper into that? I know you're getting ready to, but you just triggered it off right now for me. The political, uh, the, the, the instinct blindness to these natural impulses that we're not even aware when we're being marketed to by politicians, marketing companies, advertising. You want to get into that a little bit? Yeah, I am. I am unpackaging this a lot in, in, in my upcoming book, but, but, um, you know, mark. You know, uh, market executives, marketing executives, they understand evolutionary psychology. One of the things I talk about in my in my book is is that Axe spray deodorant commercial where you have this guy spraying himself with a spray, and all these women are coming towards him. You know, um, that's kind of the evolutionary dream of, of of many men. So so they they understand that, and 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 so do politicians. I mean, one of the um, 
one of the one of the debates in the, in, in the recent election, Anderson Cooper was grilling Donald Trump about about what he said on that on that tour bus, and and he kept just bringing the conversation back to ISIS. Yeah, but ISIS. Yeah, but ISIS. You know, um, so so Cooper just kept coming back to it, and coming back to it and every time. He said, "Yeah, but you know what? You know, ISIS is out there." So you know, when you wave that cape in front of people, it's like it it it, it triggers this these ancient fears of the outside tribe and it kind of blinds them. So we, we need to know what those blinders are. So we're not manipulated. And, and one of the, uh, one of the points that I make in the book is that, you know, conservatives do tend to have more vulnerabilities there in, in a certain sense, because, because of the higher fear response that they have to certain things. And it's a, it's a natural curve. Not all, not all conservatives are fearful, but it's a natural curve. You have people on the very conservative end who are, highly fearful of a lot of things, and there's clearly a link between conservatism and xenophobia, fear of the outside group that, that gets capitalized on. When you see it in the left, like when you see uh, communist regimes that come up, what, what's, what's going on there? I mean, obviously there's still um, male, alpha male tendencies or whatever else there, but it, it's kind of funny because you people consider the left to be more passive, being more community-oriented, but in a weird way, just like with cults, that's all. That's almost dangerous in itself, too. It's just a different version of that. Yeah, and I think I think the underlying psychology that you see in in, in communist societies or, or extreme left movements, the underlying psychology isn't isn't the psychological left. It's really the psychological right. I mean, you know, extreme left movements have always been territorial, identifying the outsider. Um, you know, um, trying to get control over those, in, you know, in, in, in within the hierarchy. Um, so, so, and I forget who it was at this right at this moment, but one scholar pointed out, you know, at the at the height of the Cold War, those in in the Soviet Union and those in in the U.S. who were most at odds with one another, who were most supporting their own, their own their own country and and suspicious of one another. That was really that was really the psychological right of both cultures, you know. So the ones who are most strongly communist and most strongly identified with the communist cause and that the tribe, they're really right wing psychologically. That just happens to be the you know the, the way it's expressed is through 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 that political ideology. So you know, political parties can shift, um, but underneath that, there are these stable characteristics. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I, we got to wrap up. Unfortunately, I want everyone to check out this book, Alpha God. I'm going to have all the descriptions in the link below. Be sure to ch check it out. You did a fascinating job for real. And then if, if um, people want to find out your, your new stuff, where can I send them? Can I send them to your website? Like if you, when your book is released and stuff, like how can get people to follow you? Send them to. Yeah. Well, I have a website, hector-garcia.com and, and you have links to, you know, things that I'm doing and to my Ted talk and other things like that. So you can check me out there. Which was a really great Ted talk, by the way. I, I mean, that was a really good, I, I love studying PTSD. I mean, I'm, I'm a person that also has PTSD, not from war, but um, just right. understanding how you walk back through with that. So um, I'll actually put a link in the description with that too. Check out, check out the Ted talk. It's a really, really good um, talk that he has, but definitely follow what you're doing. Do you know any idea when you think the, the book might be coming out like estimate wise, like, uh, well, I'm not sure. It's it, it kind of depends on the press, but um, we're hoping before the midterms. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, you know, maybe I can bring you back on the show for that. Would you like to, we could do that, bring you back on. And then I'd love to get the audience to, you know, follow that in and, and to read that one too. I'd love to check that out. So, man, I, I enjoy talking with you. I'd love to come back on. That would be awesome. Great. Hector, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. You bet. My pleasure. All right, guys, that's our show for today. We are a broadcast live every Sunday at 1 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, MST, which is not what <laughs> we thought MST was. Um, but if you have any comments or any suggestions that you'd like to have for me or for, for Hector, um, I'll send it to him. Um, please leave them in the comments below. This is a great conversation. I'm telling you, when you read this book, it's going to open your mind to seeing the world in a new way, psychologically, biologically. And like I said, I was already planning on making a film about male stress, anxiety, and violence, and anger. And 
when I started to read this, I felt even more priority that I had to do it. And so it really opened my mind to do it. So please go check that out. I'll have all the uh, links in the description below and you can check that out there. And, um, and of course go to uh, Hector's website. I'll put that in the, in the links in the description below. If this is your first time on the show, please hit like, and subscribe. And if you're on the audio podcast on iTunes and on Stitcher, please like, and subscribe there and, and leave a review. If you like what you heard today, uh, please share with everyone else. So that's our show for today. I'm Ben Fama Jr. And we'll see you next week. Peace out. You've been listening to Reality Trip with Ben Farmer Jr. Check out more great content by visiting benfarmerjr.com.